oh God, I have to record this presentation still. I don't think they appreciate how long I have to spend after school doing these things. All right, time to record. Oh no. Uh, okay, I'm not starting over. Well, anyway, hello everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Today we are gonna start unit seven. Unit seven is a big one, as you'll see uh, later on, but we are going to start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. So we'll walk through what will occur in the 20th century. But before we do that, but before we do that, we have to talk about what is leading up to this period of global conflict. So the bell work is on the screen. Identify and explain the differences between capitalism, socialism, and communism. Unit seven is all about global conflict. It's a very big unit. We're gonna talk about international conflict leading up until the Second World War. We're gonna cover everything basically from 1914 to 1945, and then our next unit will be our last unit, hooray. The unit objective is what you are responding to on the cover page. You are going to be able to explain the significance of causes of global conflict in the period between 1900 and the present. So really this is asking for a general overview of the 20th century as it relates to this idea of conflict. So we are going to focus our attention largely on the First and Second World Wars. But before we even talk about the First World War, we have to talk about the conditions leading up to it. So today we're going to focus on Japan and its westernization. How will Japan become a world power? That is what we'll talk about today. So the lesson objective, what you're responding to in the daily summary, is explain how internal and external factors contributed to change in states after 1900. But since we're going to focus a little bit on stuff before 1900, what you should respond to, well, what you should, what you have to respond to is specifically Japan between 1850 and the start of World War I. And I mentioned throughout unit six and unit five that Japan is going to be one of the big exceptions to a non-European country that will industrialize and become a major imperial competitor to the Western world, to places like Europe, to places like the United States. But how is Japan going to get there? Well, we first have to establish context in Japanese history. What's leading up to the age of imperialism in Japan? Well, back in unit four, we talked about the Togagawa shogunate. Remember the Togagawa shogunate is a period of Japanese history where we are going to see a very strict trend of isolationism occur. Remember that Japan is limiting trade to really only one island, to the island of Dushima, to the city of Nagasaki. And who can trade there? It's the Netherlands, it's the Dutch. So Japan is not going to be a part of the international trading community that's emerging in the 1700s, in the 1800s. So there's limited contact with the West in Japan. And as such, Japan is not really going to industrialize. It is going to be very traditional. You could say very xenophobic as well, very hostile to outside Western influence. However, there are problems in Japan, particularly towards the end of the Togagawa shogunate. For one thing, we have to discuss the political system of this shogunate. Remember that power in Japan is shared between the emperor, who is more of a spiritual figurehead, and the shogun, who is the military dictator of Japan. And right now, the emperor doesn't have any power. But by the end of the Togogawa shogunate, we're going to see a conflict between the emperor, who wants political power, 
and the shogun who doesn't want to give up political power. And even though the Tokugawa shogunate is introducing ideas of political centralization, Japan is still very much a feudalistic state. Remember, you have those daimos, those local warlords who are always fighting with each other, and they're not listening to what the shogun wants them to do necessarily. They're acting as their own independent regional powers. So we have a very decentralized system of government. So there is a degree, or I should say a lack of centralization in Japanese society during the Tokugawa shogunate. But this decentralization, on top of that burgeoning underground, not necessarily literally, but conflict between the emperor and the shogun, is a major political reason for some instability in Japan. On top of that, the shogun is losing legitimacy as the head of state in Japan. We are going to see, or the head of government more accurately, we are going to see a lot of financial problems in Japan during the end of the Togagawa shogunate. We are going to see corruption in the Japanese government. Nobody's listening to what the shogun has to say. And on top of this, not trading with anyone is kind of doing something bad to the Japanese economy. So there are problems that are questioning the legitimacy of the shogun, the more or less traditional ruler of Japan at this point. And under the surface of all of this, we are seeing calls for change. And that is the long-term reason why we will see a demand for westernization. Japan, Japan has problems. We need to fix them by westernizing. But why specifically is westernization the way to go? Why can't Japan just go back to traditionalism? Well, it's all because of a little visit by a certain American commodore by the name of Matthew Perry, who is the, uh, one of the stars of TV's uh, Friends. Anyway, I work hard. I deserve a laugh or two. Anyway, Matthew Perry is going to be one of the figures that is going to force Westernization, as it were, on Japan. And let me explain how. Perry is going to be sent by the president of the United States, a dude by the name of Franklin Pierce. And Perry's mission is essentially to open up Japan to trade with the West. So Perry is going to hop on a couple of steamboats and make his way to Japan. And in the harbor of Japan's capital at Edo, he is going to essentially threaten the Japanese to start trading with the Americans. He is going to display the military might of a Western industrial power like the United States. And he is going to pressure the Japanese to open up business to the Americans, but not just the Americans, the Europeans as well. So Perry is going to essentially be a threat to Japanese isolationism. He's breaking that. But more importantly, he is deemed a sort of threat to the idea of Japanese sovereignty. A Western power was able to just waltz in with their gunboat and force us to do what they want. So this is going to be kind of the final nail in the coffin for the Togagawa shogunate, because this idea of the imperial threat of the West is what's going to lead to Japan to be at a crossroads. Do we westernize? Do we stay a traditionalist country? Well, there are different factions that will emerge as it relates to westernization versus traditionalism. On the one hand, you have the emperor and his samurai who want to westernize, at least politically for the samurai. They want a stronger 
political and military system to prevent the Americans, to prevent the Europeans from threatening Japanese sovereignty. So the emperor wants to westernize in order to stay competitive economically and militarily with the West. If you can't beat them, become them, join them. And yet the shogun, the more or less traditional leader, really since, in this case, since the 1600s, is going to stick with traditionalism. Things are going fine. We have to reform Japanese society, sure. But we're not going to stoop to the level of the West. So this challenge between Westernization versus traditionalism is going to lead to internal conflict within Japan. And it's between these two factions, between the emperor and between the shogun. And this conflict is going to spell out into civil war. We call this the Boshin War. And essentially, the result of the Boshin War is the victory of the people who want westernization of the emperor. So the emperor at the time is a dude named Emperor Meiji. And he is going to initiate what we call the Meiji Restoration, which I will explain in just a second. But suffice it to say, this is a time period of westernization in Japanese history. This is a time period where Japan will undergo significant social, economic, and political changes. And I will explain what those changes are. And like I said, these changes are called the Meishi Restoration. We will see the centralization of power in the hands of the emperor. We're going to see the westernization of the Japanese economy through industrialization. We'll see the westernization of the Japanese military through industrialization. And we'll also see the creation of a national identity in Japan, very much similar to what we'll see in Europe. So in general, the Meiji Restoration, as I've been saying, this series of changes in Japan leading to the downfall of the Togugawa shogunate. It's going to largely be led by factions in Japan who want westernization, mostly from the military. The military especially is concerned with this idea of falling behind from the West. They're scared that Japan could be overtaken. It could become a China with spheres of influence. It could become, God forbid, Africa. So this military force in Japan is largely going to lead the changes during the Meiji Rep Restoration. So the main goals, the main ways that we will see westernization is through political centralization, through industrialism and industrialization, I should say, through westernizing Japanese culture, and also the creation of a Japanese empire. How do we become like the West? If the West is doing so well, we need to uh, copy what they're doing. And Japan, as a result of the Meiji Restoration, is going to become a major international player in foreign policy. Japan will surpass even some European countries in terms of military and imperial strength. But first, we got to centralize all of Japan to create the conditions for westernization. And how do we do that? Well, the goal of centralization is to have unquestionable authority in the hands of the emperor. This is the emperor Meiji right there. So how do we create a centralized state? Well, first, we gotta find out how to do that. We have to have a model of how to create a centralized state. So Japan is going to send foreign observers across Europe and in the United States as well. What works, what doesn't work. The Japanese aren't a fan, really, of American democracy. 
the Japanese aren't really a fan of that parliamentary system in Great Britain. But you know who they do like? It's going to be the Germans and their increased militarization. So a lot of Japanese political reforms will reflect developments in the German Empire. But now we have a model. We're going to base everything on Germany. Let's have a central point for Japanese political and economic production. Let's make a new capital. We're going to see the rise of Tokyo as an industrial city and a political city in the Japanese empire. Tokyo is going to become uh, very similar to Western cities like Paris or Berlin or London or New York City. It's a major industrial center. And that's going to be very much reflected when we talk about industrialization. Japan has a new center, and that's Tokyo. But we have to have power unquestionably in the hands of the Japanese emperor. So we have to end decentralized government. We have to end feudalism. And we are going to see the decline of the daimyo class. They are going to largely go away and are going to be replaced by a new system, the prefecture. Prefects are essentially regional governors. And unlike the daimyos, they are answerable only to one dude, and that is the emperor. So the prefects are a way of spreading out administration and making it clear who's in charge. It's the emperor, baby. But now we also have to end the system in where the samurai control the military. We have to allow for a very westernized military structure. And if the West has a military based off of merit rather than noble birth, we got to do the same thing. We're going to see with the conscription law that every male Japanese citizen subject is supposed to do military service, not only nobles, but peasants as well. And how do you get promoted in this new Japanese military? I mean, it helps if your dad's wealthy and important. But in theory, it's based off of merit. So the conscription laws are going to see an increased militarism in Japan, but it's also going to see the decline of the samurai as the dominant political or military force in Japan. And the samurai don't like this at all. They're going to stage a rebellion, the Satsuma Rebellion. But now the military is extremely powerful. They have industrial military technology. So the defeat of the Satsuma Rebellion is going to lead to the end of the samurai class. The samurai are going to largely disappear as a result of this failed rebellion. And all hands, all power, I should say, is in the hands of the central government. A central government very much influenced by events in the military. But Japan's not done with westernization in the political realm. We are going to see the creation of an imperial diet. This diet is basically modeled off of parliamentary systems in Europe. And yet, this diet, even though it's intended to be a sort of political representation, political representation is always important because it makes people feel like they should pay taxes. Again, if we go back to that idea of no taxation without representation, people tend to get mad if they're not politically represented. When new taxes are made, that's why we see this imperial diet forming, ostensibly a representative body. And yet, the diet is largely going to be filled with members of the Japanese military, members who are going to say and try to influence what the government does, what the emperor in specific does. So the imperial diet is showing the influence of the military in Japanese government, 
and supposedly in favor of the centralized absolute monarch, the emperor. But how is Japan going to back up this drive to establish and reaffirm its independence from the West? Well, we have to establish Japan's economic independence. And additionally, its military independence through industrialization. It's to prevent economic dominance of the West and to prevent military dominance as well. Turn on. Come on. Well, I'm going to do this. Okay, whatever. So we are going to see industrialization to encourage an industrial economy, but also to encourage a westernized and industrialized military. So how do we create the conditions for technological advancement? Well, we have to have a public education service. We're going to see the building of universities, of state institutions of research, research into new military and scientific advancements. We'll see the establishment of universities and technical schools, of public schools, all with the design to encourage technological innovation. But to encourage industrialism on an economic level, we have to copy what basically the West did in the Industrial Revolution. So the Japanese are going to send observers to industrial countries like the United States, like Britain. And they are going to see how these countries industrialized. And how did they? Well, there was significant government support in creating the institutions to foster industrialization, the building of stock markets, the building of a central bank, of a controlled monetary system. And that's what the Japanese bring back with them from their observations of the West, particularly the first industrial state, the British. So we do see the establishment of economic institutions to provide enough capital to ensure that there is industrialization. Remember, it takes a lot of capital to start industrialization. You need banks, you need stock markets. But you also need infrastructure. You need the building of railroads, of steamships. And this has not only an economic purpose of increasing trade, but it also has a military purpose. How do you get soldiers across your island so quickly? You can either send them on a steamship or you can send them on a train. So we are seeing the building of industrial infrastructure to support further industrialization. And yet, what is the problem with industrialization in Japanese society? For one thing, it's going to lead to a culture clash between the traditional groups of people in Japan, more conservative people, but also between westernized Japanese people, mostly that idea of Western liberalism. So those who want to westernize are contrasting with those who want to remain traditional. But another major problem is a logistic one. Japan's a series of islands, and islands are great to defend, but they're terrible at getting natural resources. Islands suck in general. So this need for natural resources, just like Great Britain, is going to drive a demand for imperialism, as we'll see. But another way that we're going to see change in Japanese society is through intentional westernization, and through more or less accidental westernization. So the goal of westernization in general is to create a Japanese national identity of something to kill and die for, something that will unite Japan in opposition to potential invasion by the West. So we see westernization to promote feelings of nationalism. If nationalism is what the European countries are doing, let's do it too. And how do you promote nationalism? Well, you promote it at a young age. 
you start to define what it means to be a Japanese citizen in basically the equivalent to kindergarten. So public education, something that we'll see in industrial countries as well, is going to encourage feelings of Japanese national identity. What does it mean to be a good Japanese citizen? In the United States, for example, what does it mean to be a good American citizen? That's what you learn about in your public school education. Schools are centers of indoctrination. I say that, um, I'll, I'll let that sink in. However, this idea of a national identity is very much focused on that value, that appreciation of the central political figure in Japan, the emperor. But moving on, how are we going to encourage an increased Japanese population? Well, you got to have Western medicine. The Industrial Revolution is leading to longer life expectancies. Let's do that too. Let's have westernized medicine in Japan to encourage life expectancy, to encourage more Japanese citizens being produced. So the adoption of Western medicine is for mostly logistical reasons. But as a result of industrialization, we are gonna see the emergence of really three-ish classes. We're gonna see the upper classes, the billionaire class, the heads of new industries in Japan, like Mitsubishi, Nintendo, companies that still exist today. We're gonna to see the development of a middle class as well. And we're gonna see the development of an industrial working class. And with the invention of, or with the advent of industrialization, in Japan, we have consumer goods. Who buys these consumer goods? It is going to be the middle and upper classes. So we are gonna see the development of Western ideas of fashion that is a representation of this intense industrialization of the Japanese economy, which leads to social classes, that are very similar to what we see in Europe and in the United States. So you should be able to identify and explain who Matthew Perry is, why he's important to Japanese history, to world history in general. You need to explain what is the Meiji Restoration and what are some of the main goals of that time period. You're also going to identify how Japan is similar or different to either Africa or other parts of East Asia. But Japan is not done westernizing. Japan needs to stay competitive imperially in terms of empire building as well. So much like the European and American motives for imperialism, Japan has similar ones as well. Japan wants to stay competitive with the West, especially to not fall behind on the idea of an arms race. They don't want to be overtaken by those Westerners. So the goal of expansion is basically that idea of a good defense is an offense. A defense, wait, hold on. I messed up the quote. Uh, hold, I can do it in a Skyrim voice. Um, wait. Um, the best, the best defense is a good offense. Am I right? I've played a lot of Skyrim. Anyway, it's that idea of staying competitive with the West. If the West is building empires, we got to build an empire. But again, it goes back to that economic motive for imperialism. We need natural resources, Japan, great island, but not a lot of natural resources needed for industrialization. So we are gonna see among this westernized military class, the drive for empire building. We're gonna see that with figures like Admiral Yag uh, Yamagata Aratomo, pictured in the slide. Aratomo is going to especially lead the buildup of the Japanese Navy in order to take territory in East Asia. 
He's a major figure in this Japanese imperial expansion. He is going to lead efforts to directly control places like the Korean Peninsula, Taiwan, what was then called Formosa. We also see Japan wanting to stay competitive in terms of spheres of influence in China. So we see this idea of creating a sphere of influence in Manchuria, in the Pacific Ocean community as a whole. So Japan has imperial desires, and we'll see by 1914, they're going to get some of them, but not all the ones they want. So how do you create an empire? Well, you need to have a degree of cooperation with other empires. Japan is going to initially ally itself with Western countries like Great Britain. So the British are going to become an ally of the Japanese Empire by the early 1900s. Basically, the mindset there is keep your friends, your keep your enemies close, but your friends, wait, damn it. Keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. If Japan wants to stay competitive with the world's biggest empires like the British, then it needs to have good diplomatic relations to not upset the balance of power. So Japan is going to expand and create an empire. And it's going to do that through a variety of different wars that Japan will get itself involved in. We have the Sino-Japanese War, we have the Russo-Japanese War, and we have the process of annexing Korea. So let's walk through what these are, why they're important. Sino-Japanese War is a war between J China, Sino means China, and Japan. Essentially, the end result of the Sino-Japanese War is going to be Japan establishing spheres of influence in China. If Europe is establishing spheres of influence, if the US is establishing spheres of influence in China, Japan should too, quite frankly, in Japan's mind. We'll talk about the Sino-Japanese War a bit uh, by the end of this presentation. But it's leading to spheres of influence in China, and it's leading to Japanese takeover of Taiwan, of the island of Formosa. I like saying that word, Formosa. It sounds like Samosa. That's the, the Indian thing, right? Or s'more? S'mores? Smosa? Smosa. Anyway. But Japan is also going to go to war with other European powers, especially over creating a sphere of influence in Manchuria. So really two powers want Manchuria as a sphere of influence, the Russians and the Japanese. Why do the Russians want it? The Russians want to build a big old railroad. On top of that, they want coal. On top of that, they want petroleum. On top of that, they want a warm water port for the Pacific Ocean. So Russia wants that territory for itself. And Japan wants it for the same reasons. It wants a sphere of influence in the north of China in Manchuria. So these two empires are going to duke it out. And guess who wins? It's not the Russians, it's the Japanese. The Japanese are going to surprise the Western world. Oh my God, non-white people beat white people. That goes against everything that we're talking about with social Darwinism and biological racism. So it's making the West realize that Japan is a equal competitor in the international sphere. It's going to have an impact on Russia as well, and we'll talk about that more in the next presentation. So Japan is going to establish a sphere of influence in Manchuria by 1904. And it's becoming a global international power. But Japan's not done. It's going to continue establishing direct control over places, places like Korea. Korea will become a center of Japanese imperialism until 1945. So Korea is going to become a part of the Japanese empire, mostly for that drive for natural resources. And the end result of this militarism, this 
imperial expansion by 1910 is going to be the establishment of the Japanese empire as a major international competitor with the West. It's also leading to ideas of Japanese nationalism. We beat the Russians. We're clearly the best country on earth. Very similar to European and Western ideas. That notion of nationalism in establishing empires is leading to ideas of racial superiority. And that's going to be very important when we talk about the Second World War. But the rise of Japan is seeing the decline of the Qing dynasty. So we talked about the Qing dynasty and some of its problems last unit. But as a result of increased Japanese militarism, we are going to see that decline of the Qing Empire. So a lot of the necessary reforms needed to fix the problems of the Qing Empire are largely going to be ignored. We are going to see a very weakened, very traditionalist political system in China, one that refuses to westernize. And that's going to have a negative impact with regards to increased European involvement, but also increased Japanese involvement. So we are going to see an intense defeat as a result of the failure to industrialize. And all the while, you have a westernized military class in China who want the emperor to do something to fix the problems of China. They want to westernize, but the Chinese emperors are saying no. They are very traditionalist, very much influenced by neo-Confucianism. So we have external factors leading to the decline of the Qing dynasty, especially with the Sino-Japanese War. But we're also seeing internal divisions, mostly uh, seen with the Boxer Rebellion. The Boxer Rebellion is a series of rebellions by anti-Western, more accurately anti-foreign, groups in China who seek to expel the foreigners. They view China as being violated by the Japanese, by the West. So they're going to initiate, create a organization, the Society of the Heavenly Fist. They're going to shun Western technology, especially guns. And they are going to initiate an effort to kick the foreigners out of China and to kick out the collaboration government of the Qing dynasty. The Boxer Rebellion is going to largely fail. It's going to fail because of European, American, and Japanese involvement. An alliance of eight countries, including Japan, is going to violently put this Boxer Rebellion down. So China is extremely weakened by Japanese imperialism, seen directly with the Sino-Japanese War, but also indirectly with its involvement in the Boxer Rebellion. So the people demanding change in China, this westernized military class, they're going to say enough is enough, let's overthrow the Qing dynasty. Let's establish a westernized republic. So we are going to see a revolution in China. We are going to see the establishment of the Chinese Republic by 1912. And this republic is largely going to be led by members from the former Qing dynasty, members of the military especially. But it's going to be a very unstable government. The last emperor of China is this boy right here. He was a young kid when the revolution occurred. And he's going to live until the 1960s. And he's going to see yet another change in Chinese history, the rise of communism. But we'll talk about that later, of course. So. Consider the significance of Japanese imperialism. What is it leading to in Japan? What is it leading to outside of Japan? That's all for today. There's a video about the Meiji Restoration at the end of this presentation, if you'd like to watch. So thank you for your attention. Have a great day.
Peace and love, one love, uh, big money, salvia out. And